everybody, this is Alex Merced from alexmercedcoder.com with another lesson in learning C Sharp. And today what we'll be talking about is classes. So I've mentioned that C Sharp is a very object-oriented programming language. Um, and then that was sort of the thing with uh, functions, okay? So that way, if you weren't creating a new class and creating functions that were methods of a new class, um, a new type of object, that you had to create them as methods of this main class object. So basically, when you start the program, you have this, basically the way the program looks like, it's declaring this class, main class, and then declaring this method called public static void, um, which is where your program is. Like This is literally anything in this method is your program um, that your compiler then says, okay, this is my instructions. Um, cool. So, but now how do you create a class and what are other uses of classes? So again, object-oriented program is the idea of just taking a look at everything as objects. Um, this is very useful, especially when you're trying to do something like a video game. So imagine if you ever play like Sims, each Sim is an object, and each Sim had its own, you know, certain characteristics that were, they all had the same characteristics, but they were all unique, each Sim, as far as maybe how much life they had, how hungry they were, how sad they were, uh, all these kind of variables. So it would be really annoying if you had to create each sim individually and program it, all those little details and all those properties and all those behaviors every single time. So what would be nice, and it also that means there's plenty of room for mistakes, because if you type that in uh, thousands and thousands of times, then every single time is a new opportunity for a mistake. So the whole idea of dry, don't repeat yourself, and that doesn't only extend to functions, but also to objects. And the benefit isn't just that it's easier, okay? That's that's nice. But the bigger benefit is if you don't repeat, you, if you don't have to type the same thing over and over again, you're less likely to make a mistake. That's the, the best thing. And also, if you ever need to make a change, making the change is a lot easier. Because instead of changing it thousands of times, you change it one time, and that fixes every single time it repeats. Okay, so this is why it's important to write very dry code. Don't repeat yourself, D-R-Y. Um, cool. So what we did here, so a class is, again, not an object in itself, but is the template for an object. So we're saying, hey, you know what? We want to be able to create this object. Okay, so for example, let's say we want to create things that are alive, creatures. Okay, so I have to, the program doesn't know what a creature is and how it behaves and what it does. I have to tell it that. But then once I tell it what a creature is, what it looks like, what properties does it have, what kind of things can it do, then I can create creatures all that I want. So the way I do that is I'll announce that, hey, I'm creating this class called creature. Okay, and essentially all your class declarations will be within that main class declaration or whatever that outer class is called. Okay, the one thing that is constant is that this is going to be called public static void. This, that's, that's constant. I've seen that the class that it's wrapped in named a few different ways. But on REPL, it's always class main class. Okay. So I'm creating, oh, where did it go? Okay, I'm creating a class called creature. Okay, so I'm creating the idea of a creature. Now, first thing I can do is I can declare its properties, meaning its variables. Now, I have three words I can use, public, protected, and private. Now, if I, if I name a variable public, it means I can change and pull that variable in the main program. So I can just be like console.log, you know, creature.name. You may not want to do that, okay? And again, you have to imagine that like programming is like an assembly line. So you may be working on a video game, and there's a cre you know there's a creature class that you're designing. The thing is that you're spending your time designing all the classes, all these objects for the program, while somebody else is actually designing the game logic. So they're going to use your creature class, but you want to make sure that they use it in the way you need them to use it, okay? So the more flexible you make the class the more possible for them to use it in a way that you, it wasn't meant to be used, okay? Or to access and change things in places you don't want them to change it. Or for someone to hack and and um, alter your program to, 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 to do things you don't want it to do, okay? So you have some flexibility in controlling how your class is used. So maybe I don't want that particular thing to be public. I may want certain functions to be public because I need people to say, hey, this class does this, this this object does that, but maybe not the variables. So I have two options. I can do protected, 
So a protected variable can be used within the class and within children of the class. Okay, we'll come back to that whole idea of children of the class. Um, and then there's private, which means you can only refer to that variable within the class and its methods. So that means you would have to create what's called generally referred to as getter and setter methods. So if I were the name age private, the only way for me to access that variable would be within the code of the methods or the functions of the class. So I don't have to create a separate function to get the information for the age, to set the age, but this allows me to control that process. So for example, what if I only wanted people to age a character after so many turns in a game? I can create an, a function that says, okay, how many turns have passed? If not, don't change the age. So you may have called the age function but it won't increase the age because X hasn't happened yet. So it allows you to control um, how some of these properties change if you don't want them to just change willy-nilly. Cool, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm just declaring my variable. So I'm saying, hey, we have a protected property. It's a string and it's a name. It's called name. Protected integer, which is my the, the creature's age. Protected int, which is the number of creature's legs. Protected int arms. Cool. Now every class, has what's called the constructor. Now the constructor is a, constructors and destructors are functions you never call. You'll never say, hey, run the destructor, run the constructor. The way it works is that the constructor is run the minute you create a new instance of the object. So once I have this creature thing and I start creating creatures, every time a creature is created, this function is gonna run. And again, just like methods when, I did, when we did functions before, is they can be overridden. So you can have many different versions of a constructor function depending on the number of parameters that, that you use in the program. So in this case, I have a construct, and the way you know it's a constructor is because it has the same name of the class. So here's a public constructor, public. So it's public creature, because it's again, the class is creature. And then there's the parameters. And all this does is take in four parameters and assign them to the properties. So name, age, legs, arms. It creates the creature. It constructs the creature, it's called the constructor. But I'm going to create another version of the constructor. So if someone passes in no parameters, and there's a reason I'm doing this, um, it does nothing. And you'll see why I did that later. Okay, cool. Now this is a destructor. So it's similar to the constructor where it has the name of the class. The big difference is that I put tilde in front. That's this symbol over here. That tells the computer that this is a destructor. So instead of running this function when the class is, the object is created, it runs this object when the object is destroyed. Which different, when you end the program, all your objects are destroyed. When certain things happen, like for example, I'm pretty sure it's like, if if the compiler no notices that there's no further references or uses of that object, um, it then destroys it in the sense. So it says, okay, you're not using this anymore. There's no, no foreseeable use of this thing. So let's get rid of it. And then the destructor will run. Cool. So, um, cool. So in this case, since this is a creature, we're going to think of destruction as it dying. So that's why when it when the creature is destroyed, it'll say this object has died. Well, it'll say this name, and then that's this, this this keyword is important. What this means, it means this instance of the object. So as I create creatures and it runs the function, whenever it says it sees like that that this keyword, it's thinking, oh, it's this individual object. Okay. So this dot name has died at the age of this.h. And then you can name functions, aka methods of the class. So here we name a, a method. And again, this is all within the curly braces of creature. Okay. So I'm saying age plus plus, meaning I'm going to increase the age by, by one. And it's going to say this name is now age this. Cool. So there's our creature. Okay. Now, before I get into the dog thing there, let's go back to the main program. So what did I do here? So he, so now you have to think of creatures defining your own types. When you define, well, when you think of creating a class, it's like defining your own type. So instead of saying, hey, int or string Alex Merced, I'm creating a, I'm creating a new thing of the type creature. It's going to be called Alex Merced as the variable name, and it equals a new instance of the creature class. And since I'm going to pass in four parameters, a string name Alex, an integer 34, an integer 2, integer 2. So now it's going to go look in my class description, look for a constructor that takes four parameters, which is this one right here. 
So, and then it's, it's not only foreign parameters, but those parameters are those types. It's a string and three integers. So basically it's gonna be like, okay, I got it. So this is the name, this is the age, this is the legs and arms or arms and legs. Cool. So it can, so that's gonna construct my new object. So now I have this object named Alex Merced and I'm gonna call on that function aging. So Alex Merced dot aging. So that's literally how, how methods work. You call it on the instance of the object. Now, you might notice, I might, you know, you might remember that I mentioned that console is an object and then right line is a method of console. But when did you ever create an instance of console? Okay. Well, that's where the keyword static comes in. So when you declare a method, so in this case, this static main method of this main class, whenever you say static, it just means that it's, there's only one, okay? So in that case, when this console is the object or is probably a class, and it's probably a static class. So they, when they declare the class, they said static class console. What that means is you can only create, there's only one and it just exists. Okay, I cannot make a new console named Alex and then do Alex.WriteLine. So, um, and then a static method means the way you call it is by calling the name of the object console and then you call the function. So static just means there's one and it all belongs to the object, not to the instance of the object. There's another example. There's another object called math. It's also static, meaning you'll never create a math object. You'll never say, hey, this is a new math. Alex equals a new math. That'd be weird. But there's this object called math that has all these methods, which are math things like averaging numbers, square roots, all these kind of methods to do math um, stuff. Okay. And the way you would call it, you'd do math dot this, math dot that, because it's a static class with static methods. So that's what the keyword static means. It means there's just one. So you can think Highlander. There can only be one. Cool. So just so you know, when you see this word static, but this is not a static class, creature is not static. Okay, so in that case, when I create Alex Merced, that's a new instance of the creature class. Aging was not a static method. So when I call aging, I call it on the instance of the class. I call it on Alex Merced. So then you can see here, Alex Merced is now age 35 because I'm currently 34. So if I aged a year, I'm 35. Then if I age another year, I'm now 36. Cool. Now the thing is that that creature class Gives me a nice starting point, but maybe I want to get more specific. You know, um, so what I can, but, it would, but instead of typing all that stuff out over again, it'd be nice if I could just take what I've done and add more to it to create something different. That's what inheritance is. I can declare a new class that inherits a parent class. So that's what I did here. I'm saying I'm going to create a new class called dog that inherits everything from creature. But everything I gave creature is now part of dog. But now I'm also add a bunch of new stuff to dog, which includes giving it its own constructor. Now, this doesn't mean it ignores the constructor of creature. It just means that it's going to call. So basically what happens when you create dog, dog is of type creature. So really what's going to happen under the hood is that it has to create a creature class first, and then from creature, it creates dog. So it's actually going to run the creature construction constructor first and then run the dog constructor. But when I create the new dog, I'm only passing parameters to the dog constructor. So that's why I had to create a empty constructor for creature. Okay, so that way it's not confused as to where's my constructor? You're calling this thing and there's no constructor. Okay. So I create that empty constructor that takes some parameters because that constructor will be called with no parameters when I create dog. So that's the reason I did that. Because if I didn't, it throws an error. Cool. So in this case, I changed the constructor a bit. Now it only takes two parameters, name and age. Why? Because dogs, um, well, yeah, dogs always have four legs and they have no arms. So in that case, those things just automatically get named. So that's one of the benefits of creating it inherited class, I can now have a little bit more control. Make sure that every dog starts with four legs. It can give its own function, bark. Okay, it wouldn't make sense to have bark as part of the creature class because not all creatures bark. But to make an, a child class called dog, it does make sense to create the bark function. And then just to make sure that it has four legs, we can print out, we can do a function where we can print out how many legs it has. 
Okay, and these are public functions, so I can call on them from outside the, the, the class definition. Okay, and again, the functions can be, uh, the, the methods can be protected, private, whatnot. Just again, the scope of that is as we discussed before. Private meaning you can only use it within that class. Protected meaning you can use it within that class and its child, child and refer to it in its children class. Public meaning you can refer to it anywhere once the class has been instantiated. So now we create a new dog, Sparky, who equals a new dog of name Sparky three. So we have a so it's going to call look for a constructor that took a string and an int. And when we go over here, there is our constructor that takes a string and an int. So it's going to run that constructor. Okay, so now we have a dog with of age three. So we just adopted Sparky, who's age three from the local pound. Okay, Sparky has gotten a little bit older. So now Sparky. Um, let's see here. Sparky is now age four. Cool. But then Sparky started barking. Okay, so he barked. Okay, and we were look. So we want to go check him out to make sure that all his legs are fine. And this dog has four legs. Okay, so the constructor did what we expected it to do. It made sure that Sparky has four legs. Now what happens is that that's it. That's the end of the program. So when the program's done, it cleans out all its existing variables, destroys all its objects. So the destructor function has run for both me and Sparky. So Sparky is now destroyed. So Sparky, and it calls the destructor that I've already declared here in um, creature. Okay, so this, so basically this name has died at the age of this. So basically Sparky has died at the age of four. Alex has died at the age of 36. That's sad. Um, but that's how that works okay um, so that's classes okay and you can there's a lot of other things that kind of keep track of far as strategies of classes now there's a lot of cool ways of using classes which is why you want to research something called design patterns which give you sort of different strategies and how to use them for example creating a factory so what if I define all these different classes um, or instead I just created one class creature but the creature is so flexible I can create dogs humans octopuses out of it and that'd be really annoying for my programming team if they had to kind of type in all those parameters every single time. So what I do is I either create a function or another class that acts as a factory. So I could create, um, you know, basically let's say my creature factory as a class. And then it has a bunch of methods that create new creatures. But instead of me having to type in all these parameters, you would just type in like creature factory dot octopus and it'll generate a new octopus because it'll just basically call on a new creature and put in all those parameters for you. And you've just made life a lot easier for your development team because you've created this tool for them to much easier create the objects they need from the object design you've created. So you have that flexible creature class that can create all different types of creatures for your game, but then you have your factory class that helps create those new creatures in the designs that you need them in. This is different things like that. Um, and that's just one example of a design pattern that gets used a lot um, that's, that's really popular. So there's a lot to this once you know the tools. So again, the main tools of any programming language are types and variables uh, and operators. So that's all the addition, multiplication, uh, what's the difference between an int, a double, and a bool. Um, it's control flow. So that's all the if statements, loops, whatnot. So that way you can control sort of how your program branches out. Um, your functions or methods. So how can I encapsulate chunks of code to be reused? And classes. Basically, how can I define objects that I can create and use throughout my program? Once you have that, everything else is just learning more stuff. So basically, everything else is just functions that are built or methods that are built into that particular programming language's libraries that you learn. Okay, so for example, now you, you can go out and learn about the math object in C-sharp and all the methods it has for you to do math calculations. But the core concepts of any language are those four areas, data manipulation, and also data sets, so like arrays and stuff. Um, so data, data, control flow, functions, classes. Once you can understand that four, those four concepts, the rest is just, you learn it. You just basically go out there, you play with it, but now you understand the underlying concept of what the programming language is doing when it interprets or compiles your code. So, um, and C-sharp is a good language to learn because <clears throat> Microsoft has done a good job of making sure that C-sharp, F-sharp, 
VB.NET, all part of its .NET platform, can really much be used anywhere. So you want to create desktop applications using the .NET framework, you can do that. You want to create um, mobile applications, you can use part of the .NET framework called Xamarin, and you can create mobile applications for Android and iPhone. If you want to create web applications, you can use .NET Core and make web applications. Um, in the future, you'll be able to create the whole website front and back using .NET, using their Blazor framework, which targets WebAssembly. So really, you have a lot of flexibility. And then plus, C Sharp is also used very often for making video games using the Unity game engine. So there's a lot of places and applications for the C Sharp programming language. So this is a good one to learn. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I will see you guys later on.